Who's ready for top five baits in Q and A this week? Look, no facial hair. I look bald, and you can see my other chin now. It's a great angle for me. Hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. Let's get these comments up where I can see you guys. Hey, first comment right there, Kyle Robinson. What is up, big dog? Let's get these comments up. All right, we are up and running. Anybody got early questions? If you have early questions, shoot them to me now while we're waiting for a few more people to get in here, and I will be happy to answer early questions right off the bat. <laughs> Look, I still have a little hair. Not much. Not much. Just a little bit. Jeff Tripp said, what the heck, Homer Simpson? That's comment of the year right there, Jeff Tripp. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> hey, Sam Halls enjoyed the Wacky Worm video. Glad you enjoyed it, buddy. Appreciate that. Brett Wren checking in. Well, I guess we, if Brett Wren's here, we can begin then. <laughs> is there any certain settings uh, that I set my Lowrance for bass fishing? Please speak to them. Um, man, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Most of what I know about that Lowrance Gen 3 that I'm running, uh, everything that I know about it, I learned from Andrew Grills, a fellow guide. And he actually, when I first got my boat, I told him, I said, just set them to whatever yours is. And he actually put my settings on there for me. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal fishing talent. He is the best trophy bass fisherman I've ever known personally, been in the boat with. He's incredible. But he did my actual settings on there. Now, as far as the palettes and the colors, I use the uh, amber on my down imaging, on my side imaging. I use the blue, the light blue on my down. And I use palette 13 on sonar. Um... That's about the, <laughs> which he uses the same thing, but that's the only influence I had, um, is the color. He said, he actually set them for me and I just ain't touched them because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I need to dig into that more and learn more about them, but they're set. So I just roll with them. I know that's a terrible answer, Frank. I can't pronounce your last name, Frank. Sorry. Miles wants me to come to his pond and do some fishing and some hog hunting. Yep, Tom Walker asked about my wife. Hey, man, I appreciate you watching the vids. And, uh, yeah, so my wife actually had chemo treatment today. We're a little bit late getting started tonight. Uh, but my wife had chemo today. It was her fifth out of sixth chemo treatment. And then she'll have radiation after that. And, I mean, considering everything she's going through, she's doing better than anybody could expect. So she's doing really well. Grass in your lake is taking over. Can't hardly fish anything but top water. What is my advice? Punch. Punch, 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 punch. Frog it, punch it. So I'm going to talk about matted grass because that's something that I'm fishing too right now. I'm actually looking for mats. Uh, so let's just get right into baits and then we will resume the questions. Y'all keep bringing the questions and I'll try to answer every one of them. All right, so I'll start our top five baits off with a punching rig because that is now one of my top five baits for this week. Um, get this thing un unhitched here. I've got my, for my punching rig, I'm going with, uh, you can do it with like a, a 7.3 to 7.6 heavy action. Um, I've got it on a 7.4 heavy limit series rod i'll also do it with that 711 extra heavy too sometimes when it's just super thick but right now i'm fishing shallow mats so the 74 heavy is plenty fine uh 50 pound braid braid is very important when you're fishing matted grass because it's going to cut that grass whenever you hook up with that fish it's going to help you get him up and out of that mat but this is this is my punching rig right here 
Bobber Stop. You can buy Bobber Stop, Bass Pro Shop anywhere, whatever, Bobber Stop. A one ounce tungsten. This is the Lake Fork Tackle Tungsten. Uh, one advantage about theirs, and it also applies to their flipper, I'll explain it in a second. This tungsten is, is a little bit narrower than uh, the traditional egg style tungsten, or you know, regular tungsten one ounce weights are going to be wider than this. Uh, this one's a little bit longer and skinnier, which I like when I'm punching because it helps get through those skinnier holes in that mat and uh, puts a little bit, you know, kind of pinpoints the pressure of the weight as it tries to go through. This is the LFT flipper. Two reasons I like this bait over most beaver style baits. One is these rudders. See those rudders? So once that bait goes through that mat and it's falling through the water, those rudders actually cause those legs to spread out like this. Hope everybody can see those rudders on there pretty good. Let me get that right. There you go. See the rudders right there? And when they spread out, they actually kick. So they'll actually swim a little bit as it's falling. And most beavers, it's just a dead fall. So you got a little bit more action. The other thing is this one, again, narrower than your average uh, beaver. A reaction, Innov reaction Innovation is a great bait. I've caught a lot of fish on Reaction Innovation Sweet Beaver. Um, but I like this one a little better because it's skinnier. And it gets in, in and out of the mats. For, for solely punching, this is a better bait. Um, so there you go. That's what you do when you have matted grass and you can only catch them on a frog or something on top. You throw that and you throw a frog, which is my next top five bait for this week. There you go, old yellow belly. Spro, popping frog. I'm telling you guys, it's about the only frog I throw anymore. And then the swim jig. The swim jig you can work in the holes and on the edges and everywhere else that you don't have to use just a frog or a punching rig. This is That's kind of my three grass options. I run this down the edges of the mats. I, I work it in, in and out of the holes in the mats um, as just a swimming presentation on a cloudy day when they're out chasing real hard. That's what I'll throw. So that's kind of my... Uh, those are my three baits for when I'm fishing matted vegetation. And that's how I'm starting off in the morning. I'm looking for matted grass areas uh, that got a lot of signs of activity in life. You'll hear those bait fish, those bluegill, you'll hear them sucking and popping on that mat. Uh, it should be obvious the signs of life in there. So those are my first three baits. And then after that, we're going out to that deep water. Now that bite's gotten a lot tougher here lately. That deep water bite's gotten tougher than what it was, um, mainly because of the weather. We've had a lot of fronts and just abnormally cool weather for May. It's been kind of weird lately. And in that situation, this is a LFT needle worm. It's actually nine inches long. It's just a long, slow, straight-tailed, tapering worm, as you guys can see there. I'm rigging that on a drop shot. Now, it's not your California light line, pink, spinning reel, fairy wand drop shot. We're rigging this thing up on a uh, 610 medium heavy rod, uh, limit series, limit five series. We're throwing it on 15 pound fluorocarbon and we're using a half ounce weight and I'm using a three aught EWG hook. So it's a beefed up drop shot, but it's still a finesse presentation in that deep water that gets them to bite on those tough days. It just sits right in their face and just teases them into biting it. The other thing is the jig. When I really just want to target a big fish out on offshore structure, I'm still going with this three quarter ounce, six cents, Divine Hybrid Jig, uh, Rage, Crawl, Rage Crawl Trailer, green and brown, bluegill type color. It also looks like a crawfish this time of year. They look, they have a similar color, a green and a brown to them. So uh, that's what we're throwing. There it is, top five baits, down and dirty, real quick and easy. All right, let's see. Jason Cobb caught, finally caught my double digit tonight. A 25 pound, he caught a 25 pounder snapping turtle. <laughs> Way to go, Jacob. <laughs> Good job, buddy. <laughs> hey, the fact that you landed that means your gear is prepared for when that world record bites. Just look at it like that. Take the positive out of it.
Yep, Andrew is the convict man. Yeah, Andrew's probably. I mean, it's hard to say this because obviously I don't know everybody that throws a big swim bait in the state of Texas. But I, I would put my money down for Andrew Grills being the best big swim bait guy in the state of Texas. He's phenomenal with those big swim baits. Hey, Brian Bustillos. He, Brian, you called me the other night, tuning in on your first live stream. We appreciate you joining us. Do I like the Strike King popping perch? Man, I hate dog and gear, but no. It's not a very good bait. I mean, I'm not saying it won't catch some fish, and it probably catch a big one every now and then, but there is plenty of frogs out there that are much better than that one. Do I think the Skeeter Owners Tournament will be one shallow or out deep deep? I, I mean, it can be one shallow. I've caught fish over 10 pounds, uh, you know, in, in shallow grassy areas. The problem is that grass... Uh, there's only certain very small areas that will hold those true giants. Um, yeah, so there's only just, it's a smaller deal. So the odds say there's a lot more areas out deep that are going to hold 10 pound over bass than there are shallow grass areas, which is what you got to have. Like this time of year, if you want to catch a giant up shallow, it's got to be the right healthy grass, the right amount of bait, deep water access. It's got to have so many things going for it. That those areas are very small and very few and far between. And if you don't fish the lake every single day, like somebody like me does or somebody like some of these other guides, uh, it's hard to stay on top of where those areas are because that grass is always evolving. It's always changing, you know. This area of grass starts growing and gets real healthy. And the next thing you know, this area that was healthy, it's dead. So it's just a constant evolving thing. Grass fishing is... It's one of the most productive things you can do, one of the most productive ways. You know when you find the right stuff, there's always fish in it, 365. But when you're talking about giants, you got to have the right recipe. Uh, so for that reason alone, odds are it's going to be one out deep. <laughs> Areas of grass on fork, where to look? You want Okay, where to look? North. I mean, really, if you go north on the northern end of either arm, there's grass everywhere. Um, you know, basically nor anywhere north of 515, you're liable to find some grass on either side in some areas south of it. Uh-oh, I lost track, I see. Sorry, the comments are skipping around on me because I keep trying to catch up to them. No, it works there. We go hunting. Our boat is almost ready for that. When I come to a new spot, what do I look for to determine what you tie up? So, man, there is a fly in here that I swear is driving me up the freaking wall. Um, so, basically, when I'm on new water, when I come to a new area, what do I look at to determine what I tie up? Well, uh, first thing I want to know, first thing I want to educate myself on is uh, I want to do a little homework before I get there, if I can. Sometimes you can't. Actually, next week's video is perfect for this because I'm going to be on a completely new lake. A uh, storm chased me off the lake I was trying to fish on, so I went and got out of the way of the storms and drove 45, 50 minutes to get to a different lake and fished a lake that I've never fished before, and I just went fishing. And one of the first things I want to try to look at, I want to look at uh, bottom content right there at the boat ramp. I want to see what the bottom's made of. What am I dealing with? Is it soft, silt, dirt? Is it rock bottom? Is it gravel? But what is it? So I want to look at the bottom content. Oh, excuse me. Woo. Man, this late cool weather's got my allergies jacked up, y'all. I'm telling you. Um, but then I just want to look for, you know, I want to try and establish what kind of bait are they eating, what kind of cover do they have in the lake to relate to? Uh, I'm going to look at my map, see if there's obvious offshore structure. Is there a roadbed? Is there obvious points extending out to the main lake? Uh, stuff like that. Uh, if there's not any of that and, and the deep water structure is not just real blatantly obvious, then I'm going to go shallow immediately and I'm going to look for the cover that they could relate to. Docks, grass, uh, stumps, overhanging bushes. Um, 
All that's going to factor in. It's just so many factors for me to sit here and try to explain to you on a live stream. But I tell you what, if you watch next week's video, you're going to get a real good breakdown on how I go about looking at a new body of water and finding fish. So watch next week. <laughs> Ryan Johnson, what did you miss? You missed everything, Ryan. I gave away the golden secret to fishing and life, and you missed it. Do I know anything about kayaks? Nope, never fished in one. I used to fish when I first got out of the Marine Corps, when I first started bass fishing again. Uh, the first bass boat that I bought was a plastic pond hopper, eight footer. Yep, chatterbait, are we still using chatterbait? A little bit around that grass where it scatters out, but only on days when they're really out chasing in the open. So, um, you know, most days when it's real bright and sunny, uh, you've just got that first window in the morning. And the same time that I'm throwing this swim jig, I will throw a chatterbait as well. I just, I tend to catch bigger fish on the swim jig this time of year. Just kind of the way it seems to work out for me. What's the most efficient way to fish floating docks? Well, if you can get a bait under them, like if there's little gaps and seams where you can skip, then the most efficient thing that you can throw is a 3 8 ounce flipping jig. Something you can skip real good. That's what you want. Um, that way, because you can throw that thing in there, you can swim it, you can let it fall, you can drag it on the bottom, you can just fish it so many different ways. That's also going to be part of next week's video because docks were part of it. <laughs> The 10 knot flashy swimmer with a convict is deadly. Hey, man, I will try. I am going to try that. I'm going to throw that flashy swimmer hook on that convict. It's just not in my game plan at the moment. Alex said, ask what depth are we finding most of our catches at? Man, it's this time of year in May, it's always like this every May. It, literally, I'm starting in the morning, sometimes fishing less than two foot. And, and by the afternoon, I'm fishing sometimes as deep as 30 foot. Uh, the offshore fish tend to be around 20 to 25 right now. You're getting closer to 20. They're starting to climb a little bit shallower. Uh, they were closer to 25. But 20 to 25 on the offshore stuff, and the shallow water fish seem to be in anywhere from two foot to five foot. That's kind of the two zones that I'm focused on. There's some people catching fish in between that, though. I mean, there's literally fish in every area of the water. It's just May. That's May. It happens every year. If you're taking kids and people that are not the best at fishing, what would be the technique that you would try first? Wacky worm. The technique that from that video this week, that is the most number of bite getting like it gets more numbers of bites than any other technique that i've ever thrown so wacky worms that'd be my first thing i teach them it's real easy they cast it out there and just kind of let it fall pick it up let it fall and uh, usually the fish it's so light and it's soft plastic they'll hang on to it for a good long time give them a good chance to feel the fish and get the hook in them so wacky worm i'm not sure uh clayton shuck I don't know what you mean, buddy. What about James C. when it comes to offshore fishing? I don't know what that question means. Give me a little bit better explanation on that, bud, please, and I'll be happy to answer your question. Grass equals bass. That's right. Hayden Marshall keeps asking me about my personal best bass. My personal best bass, uh, I actually did a video on it a few weeks ago. It's 10.1 ounce, 10, 10 pound, one ounce, not 10.1 ounces. That'd be pretty small. 10 pound, one ounce is my personal best. I've netted bigger. Unfortunately, I don't catch the big ones. The people that come with me do. So y'all call me, hire me for a guide trip. And maybe you'll catch one bigger net. Cause that seems to be my luck and how it goes down. Uh, somebody else asking about the wife. The wife's doing good. You know, considering everything she's going through, she's doing as good as could be expected. 
Um, thank you for asking. Appreciate all the prayers and thoughts on my, on my wife. Thank y'all. Greg Stacy, thinking about getting into a few local fishing tournaments. Nervous and overwhelmed by their top dollar boats, you have a Tracker Pro 170. But I feel intimidated. How would you approach it? <laughs> Shake them haters off. Screw their high dollar boats. Screw my high dollar boat. Never fear anybody. I don't care if Kevin Van Dam shows up to that tournament. You go kick his freaking butt. If you don't have that attitude, you've already lost. My first tournament that I ever fished uh, on my own, um, first tournament I ever fished on my own was in a 17-foot Pro Gator bass boat. Now, it was a glass, fiberglass boat, but it was about 25 years old, and it was <laughs> had a 115 on the back. Uh, I did have a Lowrance HDS-5, but... Other than that, it didn't have much going for it. I had like a 40-pound thrust trolling motor. It was an old, rickety boat. That was the first bass tournament I fished on my own, and I won. It doesn't matter, dude. Go fish it. Don't be scared. You won't learn unless you go. Just go and get after them. And never, ever, ever back down and be intimidated by anybody. Because that fish has no idea what's floating above his head except it's something big. Next time on water, go through the Lowrance settings. You're convinced yours is either broke or not set up right. The settings uh, probably are not set up right. Look up Frank Bazacalupo. I'm sorry, man. I know I'm murdering your name. But Frank, look up Doug Varenberg on YouTube. He has the best uh, sonar videos in the game. He explains how to set everything up. He's great. What are my thoughts on Dobbin Drops? They're great. Great rods. I, that's the pro staff I was on before I went to Limit. They're awesome rods. Very, very, very good rods, Dobbins are. They're a little bit high priced for some people. That's one thing I love about the Limit is it kind of represents what's more true to me. I've never been a guy to spend three or $400 on a rod. I've had some of those, but usually I got them given to me or I want them or something like that. Um... These limit rods, 130 to 150, that's more in the lines of something that I would buy before I started guiding and everything and, and getting on pro staffs and all that. So that's kind of one thing that makes me feel better about being on the limit staff. And on top of that, these rods are just as good, in my opinion, and they're 130 to 150. So they're the best value in the game on rods. Jason Cobb, I skipped your question. <laughs> I didn't see what your question was, man. I'm sorry. My comments were skipping around because I, I wasn't able to keep up with all the questions coming in. I'm doing the best I can, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't listen to Ryan Johnson, Greg. Do not loosen the nut on your prop. That's a bad idea. <laughs> yup. Don't be scared of the other guy's boat. That's for sure. Greg Stacy, you got to let us know how you do, man. After you fish that tournament... You need to get on one of these live streams or get on a comment on one of my videos. Let us know how you did, bud. Have I ever fished Lake Amistad? Yes, I have, but it's been a long, long time ago. It's an awesome lake. Beautiful. Probably the most beautiful lake I've ever been to. Uh, if, you, if me and my dad booked a trip in August, what would we be throwing? That depends on the grass. So what happens when you get into that super hot time of year in Texas is you get that thermocline set up. And then if you have healthy grass it puts more fish in it. So we could be doing some of the same stuff we're talking about now, frogging, punching, swim jigging, uh, if there's good healthy grass in August. Now sometimes it gets so hot that it kills that stuff and it starts dying and they don't stay in it. Um, in that situation, we'd probably be fishing a lot of Carolina rig, uh, flutter spoons, stuff like that. Joe Mullis kicking into the YouTube fund. Joe Mullis, you are my boy. Thank you very much. Joe Mullis with a donation into the YouTube fund. If you guys don't know, there's a super chat thing on here where you guys can donate money. All the money that gets donated during these live streams will go right back into making more YouTube videos, uh, equipment, 
you know, different camera equipment, different editing equipment, editing software, stuff to make these videos better and more of them. Uh, travel to go to different lakes and get you guys videos. Maybe on like Falcon, Toledo Bend, Rayburn, Gunnersville, Florida, all kinds of stuff like that. Now that I'm full-time guiding, there's no telling where I'll end up doing these videos. And every dollar that you guys kick in on this will go to that. So thank you, Joe Mullis. You're the man. So Clayton Show. Yeah, that's that's if, if we weren't fishing the shallow grass that time of year, uh, then we would be fishing. You know, what we're doing right now, what we're starting to do is kind of sets us up for the rest of the summer. Later on in the summer, we tend to throw Carolina rigs and flutter spoons a bunch. Or we could go to some of my secrets lakes that I don't really tell anybody about where they got matted grass everywhere and we could throw frogs all day and just get after them. We can do that too if that's something you're interested in. type of baits and technique do I use to fish offshore? Wow, that is a open question, Brent Wren. So offshore fishing, and actually, you're going to see some of it, I think, it's either next week or the week after that we're going. Um, but right now, the jig and the drop shot have been the deal here lately. Carolina rig, uh, deep crank baits, flutter spoons. Sometimes we get them out there on them big jig heads on swim baits. Yeah, boy. That kind of covers the gamut. That's about what I throw out deep. I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting. What pound line for the drop shot? 15 pound fluorocarbon, half ounce drop shot weight, three out EWG hook on this nine inch needle worm LFT. Dude, I'm telling you guys, this worm right here, it catches a ton of fish. You can throw a shaky head or drop shot. Either way, it's a bite getting full, man. This thing will catch the entire school sometimes. It's crazy. Check it out. It's on LFT's website, Needleworm. Look it up. Favorite lake besides Fork and Toledo? Well, that's one and two. <laughs> what is my favorite lake besides Fork and Toledo? Man, we've got so many. I really like Pines a lot. Uh, Monticello over the last year or two has really become one of my favorites. It's a small lake, but it's awesome. Probably Rayburn. I mean, I know that's another kind of standard answer, but I love Rayburn. I've got a lot of childhood memories of my dad on Rayburn, uh, some nostalgia there. So, yeah, Rayburn's number three for me, I would say. Oh, but I don't know, man. Fal Falcon could be it, but Falcon is that deal. Like, Falcon can also be the worst lake, like, it all depends on the water level and what the water level's been doing the last couple of years. And sometimes Falcon is awesome and sometimes it's not very good at all. What's my favorite moving bait to use in the trees? Square bill. Uh, depends on what depth I'm fishing. If I'm fishing a moving bait in shallow, shallow trees, then I like the Movement ADX hands down better than any other. It bounces off that wood better than any crankbait I've ever seen. Six cents Movement ADX. Um, if I want to get a little bit deeper in that five, six foot range, then I go to the Movement L7, which is the same bait with a square bill on it, goes a little deeper. Uh, and then the six inch lures 250 MD is like a 10 foot diver, and it goes through wood phenomenally well considering it's a round build crankbait. So, crankbait, obviously, crankbait is my favorite moving bait in the wood. What would be the best? Bait to throw right now in Georgia. I have no earthly idea. For Georgia, I don't know, man. I know some of the lakes out there in Georgia got spotted bass and they're like highland reservoirs with mountains and a clear water and some of them are swamp water with cypress trees. So I have honestly no idea. Need a little more details uh, on what kind of lake you're fishing to tell you what I would, what I would fish. Have ever fished Lake Whitney? No, I have not fished Lake Whitney. That is one that I have not been to. Five, okay, Jason Cobb fishing a shallow pond, 85 acres, five to seven foot average, a lot of shallow areas. One hole in back corner that's 15 foot. Where would I target post spawners? They pull back out to secondary points or are they still going to be shallow? Man, I would say with post spawn, points are never bad. Even... When I'm fishing shallow grass, I look for points. Um, 
points are just going to have quicker access to deep water to shallow, and that's a big deal when you get to the post spawn. Fish are, anytime fish are moving, pre spawn, post spawn, anytime they're you know fall migrations, anytime the fish are really moving a lot, then uh, points are going to be a big deal. So I would look at points, especially those that have some grass on it if you got that. See if I know I missed some. Can I do a video on glide baits? Man, not right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, not right now. Because the you know, glide baits for me are kind of a shallow water technique. Not kind of they are, they're a shallow water technique for me. And, and all the shallow water that I'm fishing right now is really grassy, and that is very tough to fish glide baits with treble hooks hanging off of them in that heavy grass that I'm fishing. You know, I'm fishing matted stuff right now, so. Yeah, Brett Wren, we going on the 7th, me and Brett Wren. Brett Wren's coming out with me on the 7th for, for a guide trip. We're going to have a good time. Do I use I-Rods? I've never used an I-Rod. I, I don't know anything about the I-Rod. I use Limit 5 Series, and I can tell you with all confidence, you will not be disappointed in a Limit 5 Series. I know, that's, pro, that's so pro staff. But it's true, though. I mean, I mean it, but that's so pro staff. Local lake has a sandy shoreline. What should you be using? You caught eight yesterday on spinnerbaits and sinkos. Well, sandy shoreline, that's tough because that's like no cover. I mean, this time of year, I don't know where you're at, but like for down here, if you have just kind of a blank sandy bank, then those fish are going to go out deep this time of year, usually, if there's no cover up shallow like that. Um, I would say in that situation, if you're restricted to that shallow water with not much cover, that the sinko or a wacky worm or a drop shot are gonna be your best bet, bud. Yep, punch, okay. Matthew Carville says, when you're fishing thick, heavy vegetation, what am I using? Local spot where the reeds are growing in nice, but thick in some areas. So how or what can I fish in that thick slot? Punching rig, buddy. Punching rig, punching rig, punching rig. One ounce weight, bobber stop to peg it. Oh, I didn't talk about the hook on this. That is actually a 4 must must-add, heavy-duty flipping hook. Um, you want a straight shank, big heavy gauge hook, and a small, compact, narrow creature bait. Throw that sucker right on top of that grass and let that one-ounce weight take it through it because underneath all that thick stuff, it's open underneath there. So punch it. Punch it, punch it, punch it. Hey, search uh, your Lake Fork Guide How to Punch. And I bet you that one or two videos will pop up where I do full breakdowns on punching because I've made a couple of them in the past. No problem on the double post. Doesn't bother me in a bit. Glide, glide baits? Stealthy Flathouse. Do you want to see what a glide bait looks like? I'll show you one. Hold on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm coming back. Two favorite glide baits right here. This is my big one. That's the HPH Gliding Gizzard. Just a single joint. See that? This is the uh, Six Sense Flow Glider 140. It's a little bit smaller. It's a lot smaller. See how much smaller it is. Um, these glide baits, as you can see, they just got a single hinge and they swim in an S curve. When you just kind of slow roll them, they swim like this. And then you twitch them and they go, choo, choo. and they glide out to the side. Big old slow hard body swim baits, what it is. Joe Mullis asks, in what circumstances do I throw straight braid or do I always use a leader? No, I almost never use a leader. Uh, <laughs> Straight braid when I'm fishing around real heavy vegetation. So frogging, anytime I'm fishing something on top with real heavy vegetation, uh, <clears throat> any type of frog, I'm going to throw braid. Punching, I'm going to throw braid. Uh, that swim jig, if I'm throwing it, you know, through the holes and all the real thick, heavy stuff, I'm going to throw braid. So when I'm fishing a technique that I'm going to be getting into the grass and it's heavy grass, and I'm going to throw straight braid. I've never fished Lake Allen Henry. Somebody asked if I ever fished Lake Allen Henry. I know it's awesome and I need to get there, but I've never fished it. What is my favorite rig? Hey, clarify that a little bit for me. Uh, I don't know what you mean favorite rig. Favorite Carolina rig, favorite just fishing bait, favorite rod and reel combo. What do you mean by rig? 
Could you do a live bait video? Man, I don't fish live bait, Clayton Shuck. I just don't ever do it. I can't tell you the last time I put a hook in a minnow, bud. <laughs> Broke the tip off your Dobbins champion. If they use the Fuji replacement kits, is that okay? You just broke the last tip. If you just broke that last guide right on the tip, yeah, just put that Fuji replacement on there. It'll save you some time and money. It'll be fine. It won't hurt nothing at all. I, I actually did that myself to a Dobbins back in the day. Okay. Uh, when I'm talking about punching, Brian Bastillos is asking what kind of grass what I'm talking about is grass it can be emergent vegetation like uh, gator weed, pond weed, duck weed, hyacinth water lilies, lily pads it can be that type of vegetation um, where it's sitting on top of the water or it can be hydrilla or coontail or milfoil that grows up from the bottom and then mats and spreads out um, so any the vet, it's on the surface you can visibly see it um, to punch it now, there are times that, you know, when grass grows deeper that we'll punch deeper grass that's just blooming at the top and open underneath it, but that's a different deal than what I'm talking about. Right now, what I want to see is I want at least two foot of water underneath that mat. So I want it to mat up in at least two foot of water for right now. If it's that deep, then I'm okay. Uh, I prefer to see it four or five foot, but right now, two foot's all I need. Once we get to July, then I need four or five foot. But two foot of water underneath a mat of grass, I will punch it. No leaders. <laughs> Have you ever fished a Ned Rig? Joe Mullis, did you watch that video on Wednesday? If you watch my video that came out on Wednesday about the wacky worm, then you'll see that the way that we fish wacky worms, that the way that Zach was talking about is the way I fish it, and it is a Ned Rig. I was fishing a Ned Rig before a Ned Rig was a Ned Rig. Uh, we're just using a nail weight instead of a screw-in weight. It's not as bulky. It's a more finesse version of that. So I guess technically I fished something like a Ned Rig, but we've always just called it a wacky worm. We had a nail weight in the head, so it stands up. Storms rolled in Sunday, temp dropped a bit. Do fish know that the storm is rolling in? If so, what should I look to retie? Where am I looking for them at that point? They don't know the storm's rolling in, but they know that the pressure's dropping. Uh, they know there's a weather system of some sorts coming in through their instincts. They're not smart animals, but they can feel what's going on in their world. Uh, the book says they get more active. Typically, you know, they'll get to chasing the bait a little more, so just go to more moving baits versus uh, slow moving baits. They should bite more aggressively at that time. Other than that, don't worry about the rain. The fish are already wet. I prefer a swim bait on the back of a swim jig. That's how I do it. Now, the rage crawl does work on the back of a swim jig. I've caught plenty of fish with a rage crawl on a swim jig. Uh, a little more versatile with the crawl in there because you can fish it as a swim jig or you can drop it to the bottom and fish it as a flipping bait. But when I'm strictly swimming it, I feel like I catch bigger fish with a swim bait on the back of it. Sorry, just doing the live feed. My buddy said get a water pl whopper plopper. Any experience with this lure? Yep, get you a whopper plopper. And just throw it and have fun. You're welcome. <laughs> Favorite state to fish other than Texas that I've actually fished myself is South Carolina. I used to live in South Carolina, so I fished there a bunch. <laughs> 